Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by Arc. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by Arc or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by Arc to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of Arc Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI. I'm Simon, one of Arc's genomics analysts. This week, we're lucky to be speaking with Dr. Bert Vogelstein, one of the most prominent and cited scientists within oncology. Dr. Vogelstein's pioneering work on tumor biology laid the groundwork for our understanding of cancer evolution, earlier disease detection, and precision therapy. He's currently appointed as a professor of oncology and pathology, as well as director of the Ludwig Center for Cancer Genetics and Therapeutics at the Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center, within the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Our conversation today is mostly focused around earlier cancer detection, overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and how important molecular diagnostics are to improving patient outcomes over the long term. If we look out across the last 10 years or so and look at specifically what we've done right and what we've done wrong to address cancer mortality, all things considered, what do you think we've done right and wrong what have we done right or wrong or what could we do better and this is true for all illnesses how does one reduce death from a disease there are two basic ways one is through improved prevention and one is through improved management or cure and Well, I think one could contrast in a general way what's happened with cardiovascular disease, strokes, heart attacks versus cancer. The focus for nearly a half a century in cardiovascular diseases has been on prevention, both primary and secondary prevention, which I can explain in more detail if you'd like, rather than curing patients who have had severe myocardial infarctions or severe strokes. And unfortunately, patients who have severe events like that still can't be cured. But many fewer people are having those events. And as a result, the death rates from cardiovascular diseases, strokes, have plummeted in the last 60 years by 75%, to which cancer decreases. Really, cancer pales in comparison in terms of the number of deaths that have been reduced. And there are many reasons for that, but I think one of the reasons is that cancer research in general has been focused on curing advanced cancers. Patients who can't be cured by surgery or conventional therapies radiation, mm-hmm. etc., but patients who have metastatic disease. And that research is critical because there will always be patients who have metastatic disease and new treatments for those patients are desperately needed. But I think there has been relatively little attention, relatively little research and relatively little funding devoted Mm -hmm. to cancer prevention, and that includes both primary and secondary prevention. And uh, Bill Height, who used to be the head of oncology at J&J, one of the things I remember him saying at a think tank was that 100 years from now, people are going to say, why did you guys wait so long to detect these cancers when they were so advanced? Mm -hmm. Why wasn't more effort devoted to detecting them when they were early and when they had much better chances of being cured? And in terms of what we could do better, I think we could devote more 
resources, funding, time to the idea of prevention, both primary and secondary. And I can explain that. Yeah, I was going to ask if you could maybe just elaborate on the difference between those two or what they are. Sure. So primary prevention is intervening or acting to prevent the onset of disease. So the disease never occurs. Secondary prevention is based on detecting the disease at a stage when it can still be managed and thereby preventing serious consequences such as death. And I think in the COVID-19 atmosphere that we have today, that that analogy is clear. What is the best way to reduce deaths from COVID-19? Well, one way would be you wait till patients are on a ventilator and very sick and then try to miraculously save them. Right. And that's mm-hmm. important because a lot of people can get on ventilators and are very sick. But another way, which would be primary prevention, is a vaccine so that people never get infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's primary prevention. And the secondary prevention would be waiting till a person was infected but still not very sick and using some sort of drug to prevent them from ever needing to be in the hospital. And I would say from a public health perspective, the best way would be primary prevention. Mm -hmm. That's the same for cancer. The best way to reduce deaths from cancer is through primary prevention, which means people don't smoke, people watch when they're in the sun, people exercise, do all the things that are now known to decrease cancer incidence. Mm -hmm. The second best way would be to catch cancers at an early enough stage so they can be treated with surgery or whatever therapies are available. And the third way, which is still important, but from a public health perspective is the worst way, is to wait till they have advanced disease and then try to cure them. Right. And the balance between research on those three areas is extremely important, not only for COVID-19, but also for cancer and other diseases. And I think it's safe to say that more people understand the importance of primary and secondary prevention for COVID, but we're just getting to the point that I think the public is starting to appreciate the importance of uh, especially secondary prevention. And that's why I'm so delighted that we're beginning to see a lot of both academic and industrial support for Mm -hmm. early prevention methods. And that's very comforting to me because I've kind of been on this bandwagon for 30 years (laughs) trying to change that. And I I think the tide is turning, but we've still got a long ways to go. To your point on the focus that's been given on improving treatment for patients that are afflicted by advanced or, or metastatic disease, on a relative basis, that's a much smaller patient population ostensibly than this long tail of people with earlier stage or even indolent tumors. And I think when you get to that perspective, you start hearing not necessarily pushback, but concern from some of the parties that you mentioned. Maybe I'll name a few. Obviously, the payer networks, the industrial community, maybe some coming out of the actual physician communities as well. There's sort of this concern around well, what about things like overtreatment? I know there are some concerns there, and we can just start broad again on this question too. But when you think about the interim period, hopefully the transition through which we start to really invest and emphasize on earlier detection and treatment, how do some of those parties need to change the way they think about cancer, right? So the test providers, the payer networks, Physicians, I know, are concerned about this as well. And then maybe even out to the population at large, what can they be doing to be proactive and involved with their care? 
Yes, and those are important questions and important criticisms of all early detection approaches. And again, it's a balance. Yes, there will be problems with overdiagnosis. There will be problems with patients who have either false positives or true positives, cancers, but who might have lived to the age of 100 without having any symptoms. There will be cases of overtreatment, and that's all true. And you could lump all those together as overdiagnosis. Now, what we have now is underdiagnosis, and that is often not balanced against overdiagnosis. So why do I say we have underdiagnosis? Because there are half a million people who die in this country each year from cancer. And almost all of them die only because their cancers weren't detected until too late. Every advanced cancer starts as an early cancer. In formal medical terms, every stage four metastatic cancer, every single one without exception starts out as a stage one cancer, localized. I'm talking about solid tumors, of course. So right now we suffer from underdiagnosis. There, of course, will be a potential problem with overdiagnosis, but unless some way to confront the underdiagnosis is developed and tested, we'll never be able to form that balance. Right. And, and to just say, well, overdiagnosis will always be a problem, so let's not try to <laughs> test yeah. cancers earlier. I mean, to me, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you could say, well, cancers have always been hard to treat. Why should we try to invent new ways to treat them? The reason is because there's a need. And yeah, those treatments might induce side effects, horrible side effects, but they may save lives. Is there maybe a need to kind of modernize our view on evidence accrual or maybe think differently given, and this is where I'm trying to steer the conversation as well, because I definitely want to speak about cancer seek specifically and liquid biopsies versus the incumbent screening techniques, but is there something that needs to change in terms of how we look at evidence for the more practical or medically responsible use of liquid biopsies in clinical practice? Yes, I believe so. Let me see how best phrase this. I mean, one thing, I guess, to keep in mind is history. I mean, we can learn from history a lot. And those tests, which have unequivocally reduced suffering and death, those secondary prevention-based tests like colonoscopy and other ways of detecting colon cancer, mammography, pap smears is the first and best example. Whenever there has been a reasonable test and it's been implemented in a wide population, it has been shown to be able to reduce morbidity and mortality. There are very few exceptions to that. And these tests aren't perfect. Pap smears aren't perfect. They don't have perfect sensitivity or specificity. Mammography is far from perfect. But Clinicians have learned how to use them, how to explain to patients what the risks are and what the benefits are and how to follow up positive tests. So over the course of several decades, they have become part of routine medical practice and have been made standard of care. I mean, pap smears are perhaps the best example in in parts of the country where pap smears are routinely used, cervical cancer deaths have been reduced by 90%. That's huge. So why should it be different with other cancers is the question I would ask. It should be the same. Now, they may not always be as easy as cervical cancers, but I think that what medical history has told us about early detection test is that it generally works pretty well. And the better the test, the better it works. Mm -hmm. So that's one answer. A second answer is, and this is complex, because with colonoscopy, it was routinely used for decades before a study came out 
that showed that colonoscopy actually reduced deaths from colon cancer because that requires huge population-based studies. But people were already using it because mostly common sense. It made sense. You detect tumors early, you take them out, and you should decrease the risk of subsequent cancers. And at some point, some sort of common sense in the absence of all of the data, we're not going to be able to make decisions based on complete information. That's hardly ever possible in medicine, but it's certainly going to be true for early detection. And the example that I like to use is suppose somebody had an incidentally detected cancer, say a lung Mm -hmm. cancer, you know, that they thought they had COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, right, 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 right. Okay. So they go in for a chest x-ray and they see that, hey, that looks like they have a stage one lung cancer. Well, what do you do? Do you say, let's just wait until it's symptomatic? Because there has never been a study, a formal double-blinded controlled study showing that surgery for most early stage cancers actually saves lives. But I think most people would agree that if they had a stage one cancer detected incidentally, they'd want it out. Right, yeah. Despite the fact that it might be indolent and despite the fact that you can't know whether it would ever progress. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's going to come down to that kind of reasoning is going to have to be involved. I think it's going to take a very long time before you can show that every cancer detected by a blood test, by a liquid biopsy, would eventually progress and kill the patient. And that's probably not even true. But some fraction of them will. And what the benefits and risks are, are going to have to be decided on the basis of incomplete information. Now, how to do that? I think we're just coming to grips with that now. How do you make those difficult decisions? One way I like to think about it is how many curative surgeries you can do on the basis of a test result versus how many futile surgical procedures, unnecessary surgical procedures result from testing. Now, that's not the only statistic that's important, but I think that's a reasonable one and frames the context. And, Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that we did in the DETECT A study is we look specifically at that. So in those patients, again, 10,000 women between 65 and 75 years of age, there were 12 cancers detected by blood testing that had surgeries with intent to cure. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we don't know that those patients are all cured. We know that I think all of them are still alive and I think doing well at least at the end of the study, but we don't know they'll be cured. And you can ask the opposite question, how many futile surgeries were done? And the answer to that was maybe none, maybe one. There are only three patients who had any surgeries resulting from false positive tests. Two of them had advanced premalignant lesions, which current medical practice would suggest should have been removed. One of them had a large symptomatic ovarian cyst adenoma, which one could arguably say should have been removed anyway. But the overall point was that there were very few unnecessary surgeries and a significant number of surgeries for people who otherwise would not have been known to have cancer at the time. And you could certainly argue that maybe all of those 12 patients would never have become symptomatic and would have died from other diseases. It's possible, but I don't think you'd want to do a controlled trial to wait and not treat them. (laughs) Yeah, No, I mean, I think it's from your study of the early, early tumor pathogenesis, when did you first figure out that it might be possible to actually gather information on a tumor using circulating tumor DNA and the protein biomarkers that were already sort of there. I'm just wondering about, was there an aha moment or how did that happen? And maybe as a second part of that question, 
I know that there have been some obstacles in the way that whether it was cancer seek or I've seen other papers coming out and writing on issues such as clonal hematopoiesis, as well as the issues around very low circulating tumor DNA input volumes. What were some of the big challenges in constructing CancerSeq, and how did you get around those, maybe using technology or other sort of insights that you and the team had along the way? Yeah, well, the history goes back 30 years. In the 80s and early 90s, our laboratory was mostly interested in trying to discover the, the genetic basis of cancers and which genes in particular were altered and were responsible and what alterations came first. And once it became clear through the revolution in cancer research that took place in the 80s and 90s as a result of efforts throughout the world, I think the scientific community started to think more about how that information could be exploited to help patients, which obviously was the main goal. And I think most People at that time, and even still now, were focused on using that information to cure patients who had cancer. And as I said before, that's, of course, critical. But my background was different. I trained as a pediatrician clinically, and I was aware that the main decreases in infant and childhood deaths came from prevention rather than treatments. Not that treatments weren't important, but if you look at it from a public health perspective, it was clearly the preventative aspects, the vaccines, the public health measures, et cetera, that dramatically reduced childhood deaths. And so with that focus in mind, once these genetic alterations became clear, that suggested a different way to control cancer, at least to me and my colleagues at Hopkins. And that was, instead of using targeted therapies, use targeted diagnostics. The same genetic information that has revolutionized cancer treatments, that is treating specific genetic alterations with targeted drugs, could also be used for diagnostics. So instead of less specific metrics or analytes, one could use the mutations themselves as the guideposts, as the actual abnormality that was detected. Now, back in the 90s, that was somewhat science fiction because in order to do that in a high throughput and specific way wasn't possible. But early studies from our group showed that you could detect genetic alterations in urine, in patients who had bladder cancer, in stool, in patients who had colon cancer, and that eventually led to exact tests, Cologuard. But doing it in plasma was something very special because obviously that allowed in principle the detection of many cancer types, not just colon cancers or bladder cancers. And the technology for doing that was simply not available in the 90s. And we set out at that time to try to help create that technology. Ken Kinsler, who co-directs our lab, and I were able to develop what's called digital PCR, which is essentially converting an analog signal to a digital signal And that is sort of the conceptual basis for looking for rare mutations of any kind, whether they be in the plasma or other bodily fluids. And that gave way to other technologies. However, in the 2000s, beaming was one. And now with next generation sequencing, something we call the safe sequencing system, which was used in CancerSeq and in Detect A, and that technology is still developing. So it's been a series of technological improvements Mm -hmm. that have permitted one to actually look at rare mutations in plasma and detect early cancers. And that has really just recently come in the past few years. And that's what is needed to detect very early cancers. Liquid biopsies are used in many contexts. 
One is to follow patients who have cancers, advanced cancers, and to try and determine what drugs they might be most susceptible to based on the genetic alterations of molecules floating in the blood. And that's an important application, but it's low-hanging fruit compared to early detection. Early detection, one is talking about a very low tumor burden giving rise to a relatively small number of molecules that are floating in the plasma and the ability to detect them optimally at a stage prior to when patients are symptomatic. That's the key to what I consider early detection. And the technology for doing that, again, is very recent. But now we have the potential to do it. The technology will continue to evolve and continue to get better, but it is certainly a foothold. And as demonstrated with the Cancer Seek study and the Detect A study from our group and the studies from many other groups, it's now possible to do it. Now, questions about how many patients you're going to help under diagnosis versus what we currently have an overdiagnosis, that will take a large clinical studies. But the technology is here. As far as I can see, the writing is on the wall. I mean, mm-hmm. there are, some of these tests are very likely to be implemented, I think, and are likely to have good ratios of benefit to harm. But the technologies also are going to improve just like sequencing has improved over the past 10 years. Um, It's just a matter of time. From the perspective of a physician, but the tissue of origin readout, I know that there's a lot of divisiveness amongst how that would be taken up in the clinic. And so I'm wondering from your point of view, if you could talk a little bit about tissue of origin in the context of how a physician might become accustomed to seeing that on a test report. Sure, I'll do that. And then I'd like to perhaps say a couple of words about what your listeners might expect from liquid biopsy-based tests in the near term, because I think that that could use some clarification. So in terms of tissue of origin, that's a very important topic and one we try to address in the Cancer Seek study. We showed in that study that you could predict with reasonably high accuracy the location of the suspected tumor to one organ, sometimes two organs. And at that time, we were thinking that that might be very helpful to guide follow-up after a positive test. But when we were thinking of actually using it in the real world, rather than simply publishing a paper, we began to realize that a blood test for tissue of origin was not necessarily going to lead to the best route of follow-up. And our reasoning was very simple. None of these tests, including cancer seek, is perfect. They have false positives and false negatives. And we looked at what would happen if you had a 30% or even a 40% positive predictive value which means that, say, one-third of the patients that have positive tests actually have cancer. Now, that positive predictive value is very high compared to most other screening tests, very high, five to ten times as high. But it's far from perfect. And suppose one had a test that has 30% or 40% positive predictive value, and stop me if I'm getting too technical. But the upshot of that is the tissue localization based on blood testing itself has got to be wrong in most cases, because most cases won't have cancer at all. Most of the positive tests will be false positives. So it will be impossible to get a tissue localization that is accurate when there's no cancer at all. So instead, when we designed the Detect A study, we started thinking about, well, suppose a patient has a positive test. What is the best, most efficient way to assure that patient that they either do or do not have cancer? A single test. And working with radiologist colleagues, specifically Elliot Fishman 
we decided that the best way would be a diagnostic PET CT, which is very sensitive and provides all kinds of information that a blood test can't. It tells you exactly where a tumor is, whether it's, say, on the right kidney or left kidney. It tells you what size it is. It tells you whether there's metastases. And that was one of the principal things we wanted to test in the DETECT A study. Rather, that relatively simple follow up approach would be helpful. And it was. It let patients know very definitively, as far as we can tell, whether they did or did not have cancer, and if they did, where it was. So that's why our strategy going forward is going to rely on that rather than blood-based tissue of origins. Mm. Does that answer it? No, that makes complete sense to me. And it's related to the second point that perhaps I could end with in terms of, though I'm incredibly enthusiastic and excited Mm. about the potential of liquid biopsies and early detection, I think there has been a bit of hype about what results we can expect from it in the near future. My dream is to have 75% of cancers in the U.S. detected by screening. Now, screening means either conventional screening, such as mammography or colonoscopy or pap smears or blood testing. And if we could change the situation now from where less than 20% of cancers are detected by screening, the others are by signs and and symptoms, I think that would make a dramatic change in the landscape of what would happen to patients with cancer, how they're treated, how they're managed. It would just completely change the landscape. And I think that will be possible. In the near term, I think it should be possible to get close to that, perhaps 60 or 65 percent of cancers detected uh, screen-based or screen-detected. And that will come from 20 or 25 percent from conventional screening with adherence to what is now deemed to be appropriate by the authorities, American Cancer Society, et cetera, and another 40% from liquid biopsies or related blood-based tests. So I think that's actually feasible in the next few years. And eventually, I'd like to see it get up to 75%. But I don't think it's going to get up to 90 or 95% of cancers are screen detected in the next several years. So, you know, I think it's important that what we envision to be true lest something be overpromised. And in context, again, going back to the beginning of our conversation, if you had developed a drug or if someone had developed a drug that would actually cure 20% of patients with advanced cancers, you would consider that a milestone in cancer research and public health. Mm -hmm. I think that that is possible with early detection that you could result in another 20% of people, at least, who would not die from cancer, who are. But sometimes when these numbers are put forth before people, they say, well, 20% is not 100%. So what good is it? And that's not my perspective. (laughs) And I Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a kind of double standard for looking at successful therapies versus successful early detection. So it won't all come at once. Cancers won't go away, but I think we could make a major dent. I think we could do what has been done for heart disease. We could do that for cancer if we focus more of our resources and energies on earlier detection strategies. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.